challenges we faced. Um, XLAM, we're going to hear from XLAM Dollar Media. Um, so Adriana is going to, going to give us a bit of background from their end. Um, and uh, Pete's going to talk about quality delivery, some safety items, um, fixing procurement and um, some site coordination. We'll provide a bit more of a background in, in the local context of, uh, of Ballarat. All right, so uh, background. So Kay Nicholson's, um, we're a joint venture. We've established to meet the needs of the uh, large regional innovative commercial projects. Um, Kay Nicholson's, I guess we, we teamed up because we're both very passionate about, um, about regional Victoria in the first instance. Uh, and secondly, we have really good, strong technical skills to deliver a project as complex as, as Ballarat Guffer. Um, so our, our skills really did complement each other, uh, especially on this, on this project. So a little bit about the Gov Hub, uh, designed by John Wardle Architects. Um, it's the first of what we hope uh, many Gov Hub commercial projects for regional Victoria. The next, of course, being Benigo Gov Hub, which we're quite excited to see coming out shortly. Um, this project, as you can see, approximately 100 mil DNC project, um, really good ESD um, scorecard, five star green star and, and five star neighbors with a, a PCA A-grade um, um, over there. And in terms of the area, as you can see, 11,000 NLA and 30,000 GFA. The, the bill itself was two levels of concrete basement, uh, four levels of mass timber um, with a concrete core and a concrete plant level um, at the top. The uh, entire building is wrapped in, in zinc uh, with punch windows on the east and west uh, and large curtain wall glazing on the, uh, on the north and south. Um, so this design um, had a high degree of exposed timber, has a high degree of exposed timber um, and addresses the biophilic goal of, of government and the design team. Um, so it's, a, it's definitely one that you would want to work in, um, especially if you lived in Ballarat. Okay, so procurement process. So originally, uh, the Ballarat Gulf Hub was designed as a concrete building with timber being a, an option. Um, so Kay Nicholson's, I guess we had to consider at tender what the implications of this was in terms of cost, program and quality, of course. Uh, and we had to consider the risks associated with mass timber, including fire, fire testing certification. Um, and, and some of those considerations as listed on the screen uh, were imperative in, in working through the procurement process. Uh, you know, the cost, the experience and capacity, the lead times, logistics. Um, that led us to partner with XLAM Dollar Meeting, uh, which has been a successful partnership um, through this process. So, as I mentioned, uh, there was a concrete scheme initially, um, and that was based around a nine by 12 grid. Um, and the alternate design was a timber structure, is the timber structure which we're building currently, which is a nine by nine, uh, nine by six grid. Um, so there was obviously um, some considerations we had to face with inheriting an existing concrete, uh, concrete design. Um, some of those things to consider were um, the fact that this had a large uh, cantilever um, that worked fine with a, with a concrete um, steel structure uh, and it had an FRL of 90 minutes. Now, we had to shorten the grid, of course, on the timber uh, structure to a nine by six, nine by nine. To, to work within the limitations of, of mass timber. Um, and we managed to provide a hybrid solution to make the cantilever ends work, um, uh, which were a little bit challenging with, uh, with timber. But uh, we got there in the end. Um, so in terms of the typical sort of uh, dimensions of, of the timber elements, 
we had, you know, when you average it out, we had about 3.3 by 6 meter CLT panels throughout the floor plate. Um, we had primary beams, uh, secondaries over primaries, where the primary beams were 400 by 880, uh, and the secondaries being 400 by 600. Um, and then we had columns, of course, timber columns, which were 600 by 680, um, all of the above being GL24, GL30 um, grade of, of, of mass timber. Um, so the design process, um, look, this was uh, a really good experience. It, uh, it was a collaborative experience with Development Victoria, uh, John Wardle Architects, of course, ACOM, um, and then the entire design team. Uh, and, you know, we developed uh, the design to address the brief, um, the inherent limitations of the original concrete structure, of course, all while understanding the design intent and the extent of biophilia. So for those who don't know what biophilix is, it's really that connection with nature. Um, and we, part of the brief was really to expose as much timber as possible. Um, and, and, you know, deliver that obviously within budget um, and uh, with, with the rest of the other elements being coordinated. So, um, some of the other things to consider, of course, were coordination with other architectural elements, such as the floor plan itself um, and the extensive fit out, uh, the structure being the, um, the concrete cores uh, with numerous steel beams in places such as the cantilever um, and working through that with, uh, of course, um, services, uh, and the reticulation of services being predominantly over primary beams, so sitting between secondaries. Um, and, and of course, um, um, the facade being um, a considerably heavy facade, uh, being zinc, uh, you know, with a substantial build up with a high SD rating and, and, the, uh, and the punch windows and curtain walls at the, uh, at the other ends. So there were all things that we had to consider. Um, just talking about the connection to other elements, so how mass timber connected to, um, to the concrete. Uh, you know, we, in the instance where we had precast panels, um, we had to coordinate with the precast uh, where we would cast in plates to, to connect the, the timber beams to. Um, we would have to, we would have to um, provide limitations as well in terms of how far the, the timber could, could connect into that concrete um, and, and what that meant uh, in terms of um, tolerances, uh, in terms of fire um, and even acoustics. So that was some of the things to consider and Adriano will talk about that in further detail um, in his presentation. Um, this is just the second image of Going back, this is the concrete original scheme, and this is the second image of the uh, of the timber. Um, so as you can see, there was far more extensive um, ceiling space that we had to deal with uh, reticulating all the services through the um, through the ceiling space there. Um, so this image on the left and right is just um, a lot of you would have seen this sort of stuff before, but it's clash detection. Um, so this, is, this was an extensive process we went through to really understand services and how they would be, re be reticulated through the floor plate, um, how we coordinated that um, to ensure that whatever x we were fabricating was, you know, 100% accurate. Um, so this, of course, took a um, considerable amount of time. We had to make sure that there weren't any issues. Uh, an example of that is, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, there's an orange cable tray, which is running through secondary beams. Um, obviously that didn't happen because we picked it up in our coordination, our clash detection. So that's that level of detail we went to, to ensure that we had a fully coordinated design leaving the, the factory, leaving the fabrication line out of extended meetings. 
certification process. Um, so this again was a collaborative effort. Um, it was understanding what the building surveyor wanted in the first instance, what the expectations were from the authorities, such as the CFA, um, and, and what the consultants uh, were very particular about. So we um, went through a process where we had peer reviews undertaken. Um, we had obviously our structural um, independent certifier come along on the journey, on the design journey with us. Um, and we developed the design. Now, in terms of certification, obviously the thing that's on everyone's mind when you talk about mass timber is fire. So once we got to a point where we understood analytically what the connections should look like, um, what the connections had to address, such as um, disproportionate collapse, vibration, um, seismic, all those sort of things, um, and of course, uh, fire rating in terms of charring, um, and then and then of course the, the lighting requirements. Um, you know, we, we formulated these sort of connection details. Um, so what you can see there on your left is a typical column with a, you know a primary below and a secondary above, connecting in um, via plates that are obviously fixed to the to the column there. Um, and even addressing how we would look at fire rating those elements um, in, in this desktop study. Then we went away and we did some, some fire testing. Um, this is an image of the CLT panel um, that was being fire tested. Uh, so you can see there, it didn't really get through any of the lamellas, which was quite good. Um, again, repeating that this was a 90 minute, um, 90 minute structure that we had to address. Um, so here's another test we did locally, which was a um, penetration test. Um, and as you can see here, we you know, exceeded the, the 90 minutes. That's a two hour um, test there, and it was still going at that point. So um, very successful fire tests we had. Uh, and then the last element of that sort of fire certification process uh, was to go through finite element analysis and really understand uh, under a loaded condition what these connections would achieve um, with, with different fire curves, um, both your you know, natural and you want to fire hydrocarbon fire curves. Um, so really, really uh, extensive process um, to, to ensure that this was the best possible outcome for the connections um, and, and obviously addressing the design that we um, had to achieve. Okay, just um, XLAM Dollar Media and they're going to present their um, part. I'll hand over. Good morning, I'm uh, Adriano Francescotti. I'm uh, very pleased to be here and I want to thank uh, Wood Solutions for inviting us. I will talk about uh, the Ballarat Gov Hub and its uh, design and construction process from a supplier point of view. I start uh, introducing my company. Xandromiti is the biggest Italian manufacturer of CLT panels who has a technical department that deals with the structural design of timber buildings. We supply CLT panels and glulam elements, and uh, in Italy we are also builders, either for the timber structures only, or as a general contractor. And that's the reason why we know exactly the construction process and what a builder needs on site. Since the end of 2017, we have entered uh, the Australian market and uh, in our brief experience here, we have been involved in these four very exciting projects. In 2019, we joined uh, the Midrise Advisory Partnership. In Ballarat Gov Hub, as uh, in the other projects, we dealt with uh, supporting the structural design, making a 3D model with a CAD-CAM software, 
suggesting construction details, providing shop drawings, supplying CLD and glue them, and uh, follow the logistics aspects. Once we received from uh, ICOM the main information related to the timber elements, we performed further timber specific structural analysis as for example deflection analysis of a typical bay, vibration analysis on, of the structural system, verifications of the possibility to make notches in the secondary beam due to the services coordination, suggestions about uh, possible optimization for uh, beams and columns dimensions, calculation of the connection. Starting from the architectural design and uh, going through the structural evaluations, we made the 3D constructive model with a CAD CAM software that uh, allows us to manufacture and uh, process both the CLT and the uh, CLT panels and the glue lamp elements. In the image on, on the right, uh, there is uh, a beam to column connection where you see uh, the cuts for the steel plates and also the pre-drill necessary to insert the dowels. In order to process this model, all connections were analyzed in detail so that uh, they could satisfy the structural and the fire resistance aspects, the stresses deriving from the progressive collapse requirements, the logistic aspects and the assembly tolerances. For the fire resistance that was largely discussed during the design and the peer review process, we went uh, through three different approaches. Analytical design for glue lamp elements and uh, CLT panels, fire tests uh, for uh, panel to panel connection, and uh, thermal finite element simulation for a typical connection. Starting from uh, a standard concealed bracket detail, we designed uh, the typical beam to column connection with uh, analytical evaluations according to Eurocode 5 and the most updated methods and the regulations. Looking at uh, the detail, you can see caps uh, and timber plugs uh, to protect the dowels, caulking strips around the bracket to fill the constructive gap uh, between beams and uh, beam and column, besides the plasterboard and the timber filler that uh, protect the connection, the connection from below and from above. When the peer review fire engineers uh, required uh, uh, tests uh, or thermal simulations, we called upon the ETH uh, in Zurich, which uh, has uh, some of the top experts in the field of fire safety in timber buildings. With uh, their collaboration, we developed and shared a specific 3D model of the connection that shows every single element to avoid uh, any possible misunderstanding of the detail. And uh, we provide also partial views, exploded views, assembled from above, from below, etc. Based on their expertise and the laboratory test data, the ETH engineers are able to predict the fire resistance of a steel to timber dowel connection. And uh, after an accurate modeling phase, they did run the calculation to obtain the results. Just to understand the complexity of the model, consider that uh, their computer did uh, run the simulation for over uh, 35 hours. Their model confirmed uh, the design assumptions so that uh, after uh, 90 minutes of fire, all the steel elements in the connections shown a temperature slightly higher than the ambient uh, temperature. Logistic and tolerances have uh, 
always a significant impact on the production on the production and so during the design process we had several meetings with the general contractor and the installer to decide the installation sequence and the assembly tolerances in addition to the usual two or three mil gap between the clt panels we introduced the tolerances in the areas highlighted in yellow around the course where we have the joints in between timber and the other materials Therefore, we decided uh, to extend uh, the approach used in uh, timber to timber connection, but uh, introducing uh, custom made steel plates with uh, bigger dimensions to give uh, more tolerance on site and uh, using welded connections with uh, casting plates rather than uh, threaded rod with uh, epoxy resin. Uh, we also increased the, the gap between CLT floor panel and the concrete thanks to the addition of a timber support fixed uh, to the concrete core. Logistic aspects are uh, strictly connected to the dimensions of the panels and the goal is to maximize the CLT production dimensions while uh, we respect uh, the container limitations and try to reduce the crane lifts on site. The cost-effective solution depends on uh, several factors, but generally, the bigger is the better. In this project, we analyzed the two, two optimizations of the panel dimensions, looking at the, at the uh, typical floor level, comparing the number of items and the containers. We also made a simulation uh, of the container. In this project, we analyzed the two optimizations of the panel's dimensions, looking at the typical floor level, comparing the number of items and the containers. We also made a simulation of the container loading with a specific software to check the percentage of uh, utilization. The general contractor choose uh, option A with uh, bigger panels. That means less items, increase of transportation costs due to the extra eight, but also a sensible reduction of crane lifts and uh, panel to panel connection. We use the 40 feet open top container extra height for uh, CLT and uh, 40 feet uh, open top standard for the Lulam elements. Once uh, all the previous steps were completed and the formal approval was received, the final technical output was the shop drawings, which include very exhausting construction drawings with all information for the builder. Plans with dimensions, a code or a name for each element and references to construction details. 3D views with the production number of every single element for an easy positioning. And construction details that explain well how to install the connections. I finished with uh, some numbers for the Ballarat Gold Hub, where uh, Isandromiti supplied uh, the materials that you see here. My personal experience uh, on this project is uh, that uh, distance is uh, a challenge, but makes uh, meetings more intense and productive because all the possible issues need to be anticipated and solved before shipping. And good uh, personal relationship is uh, what makes the success of a project. Spending some time together and uh, sharing a good uh, lunch facilitates uh, good collaboration and um, hopefully best results. Thank you. Oh, yeah.
helps me. Yep. Hello, uh, thank you, Adriano. Uh, this is Peter Spence from Fan Construction, the project manager. Um, just for local background, for those who don't know where Ballarat is, the Gov Hub's located in Ballarat, which is in regional Victoria, 120 kilometres from Melbourne, in the CBD of, of, of Ballarat. Uh, the project started in January 2019 with our demolition and excavation works um, and the, the, the picture you can see up there is our basement excavation completed. Um, during our excavation works we had an opportunity to uh, review our design uh, in relation to safety design and installation. Um, some of the things that we came up with during that time was to eliminate the, the need for installation from live edges um, and smart innovation in terms of uh, installation of uh, pre-drilled pockets in our CLT panels. All the installation of the timber eventually was installed from uh, Sizzleus, so uh, it was a great innovation to get those elements uh, drilled and, and, and sorted out prior to shipping on, onto site. Um, in July 2019, we had the opportunity to travel to Italy uh, to review and inspect the QA. Um, part of the yeah, the unique nature of this project is we had um, a relationship, a, a new relationship with Exxon Dolomiti, um, and we took the opportunity to travel to the fabrication um, and with our international supply, obviously uh, check that the complexity of each connection was um, fulfilled uh, in terms of its quality. Uh, at time of inspections, we were very pleased to see that uh, all the intimate details and the connections allowing for fire rating were incorporated into the fabrication. Um, some of these pictures you'll see is uh, direct from Exxon Dolomites uh, factory um, and these are the, uh, the yeah. um, part of the uh, international supplier uh, arrangement was to make sure that we uh, covered off all the Australian quarantine uh, fumigation regulations. Working with the Department of Agriculture, we had to make sure our specific guidelines for timber and importation was communicated, and each of the requirements was, uh, was met with our logistics partner. I'm gonna play a short video, uh, and I will be pausing throughout just to give a description of, of the site and the uh, installation process. Um, When the timber arrived in Ballarat, uh, we had to store it in an off-site facility um, and store it for logistics. Um, each of the Blue Land members were stacked internally because they were the visual grade members um, and our CLT was stacked outside. Um, as part of our installation process too, we had to work closely with the local governments. Uh, we actually had to close one of the major roads in Ballarat CB, CBD to allow for delivery of the timber and glue land um, to our site. One of the uh, key intricate details of the installation of the glue land columns was the end-to-end -end bearing uh, that had strict tolerances of one to two mil, um, which required strict adherence to these tolerances to ensure the structure had adequate, um, adequate tolerances. The installation, uh, as you can see um, by the scissors, allowed for safety installation, um, which eliminated a lot of safety issues that you come with building a con traditional construction site. The secondary beams um, and primary beams are connected with different elements to the columns, uh, face fixed and also seated connections Uh, some of the intricacies of the installation was the steel the timber connection details. Uh, an example is the vision you can see on site. These unique details require custom steel uh, to be fabricated and tied back to both the precast and composite slabs and the timber. Uh, these connections and fire solutions had to be explored and validated during the FER process with uh, a lot of technical details and reviews. Part of the installation also too was to require the tie back to the precast panel, which Jack mentioned before, um, and tying back to the composite slab and the steel structure.
The coordination between timber and other elements was a, was a paramount uh, for our fabrication and delivery. And we needed to pre-coordinate all trades with the timber, including steel facade and services. What we did is we achieved this by insisting uh, 3D design was done for all other trades and the class detection done to individually optimise installation for those trades. Um, across the project, we had around 375,000 individual fixings on the project, including the nails, dowels, plugs, um, and we also had 1,346 individual timber elements installed on the site. Um, across the job, to allow delivery and optimisation, there was 400 truck movements, um, which uh, was a challenging process to ensure that we had the right delivery at the right time. As part of um, our installation too, on this image, you can see our facade uh, mega panels going in that need to be coordinated with our slab edge of our timber structure. We achieved some of the fire rating on our job uh, by use of the FEA analysis that we mentioned before, and that was achieved through a number of elements using fire rated plasterboard at the timber and steel connections. We also used uh, vermiculite on our steel uh, and co our concrete connections as well. A lot of the coordination with the services uh, was paramount to get the right reticulation for the over and unders of the primary and secondary beams. There were instances where we had secondary beams um, at the same level as with primaries and also lower, uh, lower as well. So there was a, a challenging um, grid layout to allow for services reticulation. Some of the key features of the building obviously are the exposed timber column that you can see, the timber fire stair that is exposed from the street level and the primary beams are exposed internally as well. Um, this is a picture that was taken not recently. Uh, the size and scale of the project is, is unique. Um, it's over 100 metres long on uh, the length and uh, 40 metres wide. The iconic building obviously took some, um, took some foresight from, from and bold decision making from uh, our, our client, the De Development Victoria, and the key stakeholders to deliver a timber building and we're, we're very pleased to be a part of, a part of the, the project. Um, some of the benefits that I want to go through with a uh, summary of the, of the timber building in Ballarat. The reduction in the program due to prefabrication allowed us to commence um, fabrication well in advance of delivery on site. Uh, we were lucky enough to have a basement construction um, and do our works uh, well in advance off site. Reduction of noise and dust and water was a, a key, key feature for Ballarat City Council. Um, the local, uh, local businesses uh, wanted continuity for their businesses while we built around them. Timber has some, uh, some fast and conventional um, building applica applications because uh, the way it's built is there is no formwork underneath the timber. So it allows us to do the structure and immediately do our services reticulation underneath the timber. Uh, the local and international supply chain network, it was, uh, it was an interesting process to go through to develop and understand the quarantine requirements and the international logistics. Uh, and it was a pleasure to work with Exland Dolomedi on delivering this project. Um, and obviously with Timber, there's a, you know, there's a requirement or there is, an, there is a need if it is locally to do just in time logistics. And look, just touching on program, um, it, the, the difference between, and, and most of you know this, the difference between the concrete steel construction and timber construction is that there is a lot more involved in the upfront design uh, to make sure that it's, you know, as coordinated as, as, as possible, um, you know, addressing all the elements that we've spoken about today. Uh, so there's a lot more time spent in design um, to then, you know, deliver a, a faster construction on site. So, um, you know, you do, you do spend your time making sure that you get everything right or as much as possible because, um, you know, once you fabricate your timber, you fabricate your timber. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy process to go the other way around. Um, so, 
Designing for timber from the outset uh, is, is definitely one of the strongest tips we can recommend for, for this project. I mean, it did start off as a concrete project. Um, you know, kudos to Development Victoria for, for leading the way with, with the Bendigo Cup Hub being a timber building from the outset. Um, so that's, that's a really great thing. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we worked, it was definitely a challenge on this project for a, a originally concrete design project. Um, but, you know, we, we worked with, we had a great team around us. Um, having stakeholder buy-in and understanding what they expect to see when they walk into a building like this, in terms of the biophilics is also important. You know, in terms of how much of the, of the ceiling, uh, the CLT ceiling are they going to see? You know, how much of the, of the beams and columns are they going to see? Um, and whether or not that's even appropriate for, the, for their use. It's, it's understanding those aspects uh, of the brief, making sure that that's included in your design development process. Um, the upfront coordination, of course, we've spoken about um, all our elements are critical with timber. So it's not something that you can uh, address later on in the design. You should, these are all things you need upfront coordination with, such as obviously search circulation we spoke about, facade, any interface, trades, um, even, even carpet and tiles need to be coordinated well with timber. Um, you know, your set downs in your CLT and your beams and so forth. So there's, there's definitely a high level of upfront coordination. I've spoken about the time to develop the design. Um, I can't put enough emphasis on this. It's not, not just developing the design, it's a certification process. It takes time. Um, and you know everyone should be aware of that, that you need to spend the time, you need to work well with partners such as XLAM um, and, and the consultants um, to, to really achieve a good outcome. Uh, procurement coordination, understanding the logistics, of course, um, as Pete's mentioned. Um, and that, that also goes down to the screws uh, and, and making sure that and the connection plates and uh, any proprietary connections, making sure that we've got all those available connections. There's no point doing all this upfront coordination and having all this timber on site if you can't uh, have your connections um, on site ready to go. Um, and really understanding the regulatory compliance from the building surveyor, what they expect to see um, and, and what authorities such as uh, Fire Rescue Victoria newly formed. Um, expect to expect to see um, through through this process as you know. Mm. So it's been a great process, um, and we, we look forward to the completion of this project. And uh, it's it's on track to being delivered early 2021. Yeah, I think overall, to summarise, um, my personal experience um, with the timbers being being great. Will we do it again? The answer is is yes. Um, the decision on a timber structure was a, a bold one. Um, at this project being such a unique and large, uh, almost first of its kind in, in Victoria. You know, at the concept stage, there was uh, many considerations for acoustic and fire that really needed planning in advance. Um, and you know, those sorts of things were looked at in, in, in a lot of detail at the start of the project. Um, obviously the speed and delivery, um, there's definite, uh, um, you know, great things with timber that, that can help you with the mass structure that we've done. Um, and we've found that, you know, it's all in the design and at the design stage and detailing to get your delivery right. Uh, you've got to do it early. Uh, you've got to make the decision, get, get the detailing right to have all your connections and assembly uh, as smooth as possible. Um, and uh, we hope that, you know, there's future timber buildings like this, um, and we look forward to future opportunities to, to deliver um, a timber building of, of this scale. Thanks for listening in. Over to you, Adam. Thank you, Jack and Peter. That was absolutely phenomenal. I'm sure everyone enjoyed that. If, uh, due to the lack of the ability to hear everyone applauding, feel free to leave some comments in chat, everyone, if you uh, appreciate that presentation. We've also got Paolo Lavici, who's the program manager at the Wood Solutions Mid-Rise Advisory Partnership, who's going to join us to uh, assist in panel questions. So Jack and Peter, I might have you uh, open the Q&A function and I might just kick it off with one quick question, which I'll answer as you're reading through. But 
There was an anonymous attendee who asked, what advice can you offer to aspiring apprentices about what trade skills are most relevant to biophilic construction in the future? And what companies are looking for or can offer apprenticeships in these innovative construction processes? So I'd just like to plug the Box Hill Education uh, course. So they've got a diploma of project management for prefabricated building systems. So I might just leave that in the chat function and anyone here who's looking to uh, learn to install these projects, I, I highly recommend it. And Jack, I might just throw to you, Jack and Peter, uh, do you think this is a, a, a course that's in demand and anyone who takes a course like this uh, will have skills that are going to be very valuable for their career going forward? Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll just start off. Um, part of this project too, we actually had a, uh, a connection with Federation University in Ballarat who um, had their trades people come through doing CERT uh, 5 timber works, but they come onto site and learn about the timber construction. A lot of those people and individuals were in residential timber construction. Um, obviously, the size and scale of timber on commercial projects is, is limited. Um, however, it's coming to prominence and will start to develop more as more projects get off the ground. So um, I guess we're, we're really happy to, to develop that partnership with the Federation Uni to give those people learnings about the timber and how it's all connected. Um, and uh, I would definitely encourage those uh, who want to explore that to, to get into the industry. Yeah. Appreciate that. Okay, I'll, there's one question. It's a bit of an elephant in the room asked by Colin McKenzie. It's the most upvoted. Did you find any gold when you dug the basement? <laughs> well, let, let me preface this by saying that the original site map showed a, um, uh, what do I call it? A, um, not a tunnel, a mine shaft, sorry, a mine shaft. There was a mine shaft apparently supposed to be there, but um, I don't think we found any gold or at least Peter's not telling me. <laughs> Maybe we did. No, we didn't find any gold, Adam. Um, unfortunately, Jack's right. There was an old mine shaft that was closed off, but uh, that was backfilled, unfortunately. We were lucky to find uh, some, some crushed bottles. Um, but they were actually dumped there many, many years ago. Uh, there was about 1,500 uh, bottles. Unfortunately, they were no, of no great significance of the local, local area. Um, so, unfortunately, no. No, no great surprises. And, and no wine in the bottles. No. <laughs> Yeah, I think Peter wouldn't be in here in uh, COVID Melbourne if he found all that, that gold. He would have found a different place to be. Yeah. I've got a question here from Phil at Norton. And uh, Jack and Peter, you might speak to how it went on the project. And Paolo, you might want to speak more generally to it. Uh, how do you manage water damage to the CLT during the construction process? Well, so the, during the construction process, um, the CLT is taped up between joints. Um, we obviously dry up the CLT as quick as possible after a rain event. Um, so we, we manage the moisture that way. We're also continually monitoring the moisture content in the CLT and, and the glue lane, of course. Um, so we need to make sure that all the parameters are still within, within uh, reason. Yeah, we're finding that on Ballarat um, after rain events, uh, our moisture content of our timber, it goes anywhere from 10% up to maybe 18%. Um, and after those rain events, if we get wind or sun, it does dry it reasonably quickly. So, um, now we're lucky on Ballarat we're on the top of the hill and we do get a bit of wind. Um, and generally after a rain event, after three or four days, we find the moisture contents back down to that 10 or 8%. So, um, the, uh, the way that the timber is constructed allows you know, water to be easily dewatered from, from the, uh, the panels itself. Um, at the end of construction or once we're into fit out stage, each of the visual beams will actually be sanded back um, to its original um, fabricated uh, member um, to allow the blonde timber to come out and that will be sealed, resealed uh, with our finishes trade. So you actually, all that damage, all that water damage that happens to the columns and other members uh, will not be seen and be sanded back at the end of the job or during, during fit out. But just to add to that, there isn't really any water damage because they're protected to begin with. So uh, yeah. you are protecting them on site. Yeah. Sorry, I was just on mute. We've got a question here from Stuart Jones. In what way, and I think uh, Jackie mentioned this in the design, uh, what were you in what way were you constrained by the previous reinforced concrete design? So how, how should timber buildings really look different from the early very early phases. 
the, the most significant um, thing to deal with was that there was a huge cantilever. There is a huge cantilever in the in the structure, um, and there's significant weights as well, dead loads on on the structure, and so that was probably the hardest, well, much the hardest, but most challenging thing that we had to deal with, um, and. Uh, Inherently, uh, you know, the concrete structure um, dealt better with vibration and, and collapse and all those other structural parameters. Um, the the upside of the, of the timber, of course, was that um, you know we could, uh, where we found it a little bit more efficient, we could create a hybrid system. Um, you know, connecting obviously to the concrete core to provide that that uh, core stability. Um, and you know, integrate other elements where required, such as steel bracing, um, to to address those those challenges. So um, it, was, it was a hybrid solution at the end of, end of the day, but majority being mass timber, of course. Paolo, might you like to add to how timber might be designed, uh, how and how it might look different to a concrete building to get the design as good as possible from the, the very start. Yes, uh, there are different ways to design uh, an open space office timber building like this. As uh, Jack did show at the beginning of his presentation, they had to change the grid and that's one possibility, but uh, that was also a choice which was informed by the possibility to optimize the service runs. So having a a smaller grid, the nine by six in the middle, which was, by the way, consistent with the alignment of the course, as you may remember from the floor plan, uh, provided uh, also the opportunity to have a shallower depth for those beams and therefore make it easier to run services. Uh, then another consideration is that you can use different schemes. The post and beam, the purely post and beam is one, but there are other schemes that we can show uh, to people who are interested in the, and have a, an office type of project. Post and slab is uh, possible and we will show it into the webinar next week, for instance. Then there are uh, other possibilities like uh, the, the, the uh, reciprocal frames, which we are happy to show uh, to people who are interested. So now I don't want to take too much of the time. Another consideration is that uh, with respect to fire, there's a number of um, questions about the fire design. And uh, I think we have addressed this in some webinars already. And just a quick mention that uh, uh, draws back your memory to what you have seen into this webinar, into the slides. Uh, you can remember there as been a couple of images of uh, the CLT after the 90 minutes of fire. So after the, the test was completed and you will see no delamination at all in those images. So when the recording will be available, you can go back in a week and, and see it again. But there was no delamination on those uh, products, although the type of glue which is used is not the heat resistant one. So it's not necessarily correlated to the use of this or that brand or type of glue. It, bonding and delamination under fire is a bit more of a complex issue, which can be addressed by a test, like it was done into, into this uh, um, project uh, together with uh, uh, fire design. Absolutely. We've got the, a question here from an, another anonymous ten, attendee, and you probably expect this one was coming, Jack and Peter. How did the cost of the timber structure compare with the concrete option? Well, to start with, we had to get to a point where it was feasible for the timber option to get up. So, um, you know, working, obviously, Kay Nichols was working closely with the, with the uh, potential supply chain you know, arrived at a number after, you know, a lot of consideration in terms of what, what could we do to try and make the design work uh, within the budget. Um, you know, Paolo, you, you, you spoke about 
um, how you would design for timber. And if we were designed for timber from, from scratch, it would have been, um, the design would have changed slightly. Uh, you know, with higher grade timbers and so forth, the cost would have been probably a lot more. Um, so I guess getting back to that question, um, how it compares, uh, it's, it's comparable. It's not too far off from each other. It just depends on how you uh, integrate other elements such as a cantilever or, um, or you know, a concrete core, whether or not you look at a hybrid uh, solution. So, yeah. I think I think on price it's it's uh, you know it's on it's on parity with other design elements that you've got to consider, particularly you know acoustic floors and, and other elements that Jack talked about, steel and concrete. There are there are definitely things that uh, that come with the design that you know even things out in the end. Well, to answer this question, we have two uh, technical design guides in wood solutions. One relative to residential design and one relative to office design. I think the office design one is guide 26 and that offers a comparison of concrete and timber structures where the timber structure is optimized, is well optimized for the design. And in that case, uh, an independent quantity surveyor calculated 30% cost savings in terms of construction cost for the optimized timber structure on a nine by nine grid, so not on a reduced grid. So have a look at that. And then we as a mid-rise advisory uh, team, our mandate is to offer free advisory to mid-rise projects in Australia. So please uh, call us, uh, text us, whatever. We are happy to engage uh, with any design and development team in Australia and provide a free uh, appraisal and a free feasibility analysis. Then you go to the market based on uh, some uh, sound advice from us and the market will tell us and uh, will tell you uh, whether or not we, we uh, provided some good um, advice. I'll, I'll interject there and say that Wood Solutions have provided us with very sound advice. Um, so that's been certainly helpful, Paolo and Adam. It's uh, been great from your team. So thank you for that. No, I appreciate yeah, you provided a very good feedback because that's also uh -huh. Very important part of providing good advice. Of course. Absolutely. We've got, we've got time for one more question for Jack and Peter. You'll be able to open the Q&A bar and scroll through it. Is there any questions that you'd like that jumps out towards you? If you don't have it open currently, I can just ask one. Uh, go ahead, Adam. I think I, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, my question is a bit of a follow-on from the previous one. Do you think the, the cost curves um, or the cost comparison is going to go in the in the lower direction for timber, given that it's very early days for installers and builders and there's so many learnings up front? You've got the supply chain increasing and new technologies and everything. Do you think that it's going to reduce in costs going forward and the case for timber is just going to increase as uh, as we learn more and more about how to design and build? I'll talk from a design point of view and then Pete can talk about the construction element of it. But um, from a design point of view, I think it is going to go, uh, it, it is going to be a bit more efficient than, than concrete because of the upfront coordination. Um, I think you're, you're going to find that as, uh, as there's more collaboration, especially with local procurement, local suppliers, um, that the, the risk cost part of it is going to go down. Um, and especially when the industry bottoms out the fire engineering component of it all, um, and, and there isn't a high perceived risk in terms of fire, I think it will it will definitely level out um, and, and hopefully be lower than the concrete steel options out there. Yeah, I think from a construction cost, um, you've got to consider who your partners are and where it's coming from. The Australian industry uh, has got some very good supplies and so do some international ones. So those sorts of uh, on costs from overseas supplies need to be considered uh, when doing a cost comparison. Um, I guess from the outset, um, from any project to, to reduce costs, I think you've got to have a commitment from your design team and your client to do timber. I think that will reduce the overall costs of your project. Um, in terms of raw elements um, and fabrication, I think timber is, is in line with steel and concrete um, and in fact in terms of manpower on site 
Um, there is less work required um, with, with timber um, compared to concrete. You know, there's several other trades involved um, and uh, it does have that sort of uh, um, reduced load in terms of labour um, on site. So I think uh, the curve, while it's probably on parity at the moment, um, it, I think it's going to only get better as more projects are exposed to mass timber structure. Okay, we'll leave you there. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Jack and Peter. And thank you also, Paula, for joining us on the, the panel. No thank good. you very much. No thank good. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, everyone uh, just attending now, just a reminder for next week's webinar, here's a little bit of a taste of or a teaser of the next topics that are coming up. Next week is going to be on post and plate timber construction with Perry Forsyth. Uh, you can see on the bottom left hand side of the screen here, it's an image of Brock Common. So with the post and plate system, they get uh, a three day floor cycle. So every three days they build another level. So you can get pretty crazy productivity, which we'll learn about with this system. And a reminder, I will be sending a, uh, an email with the CPD form attached. So if you can fill that out for yourself and uh, also answer the three questions that would get you the formal CPD. And before you go, just a reminder, I'll be sending you also links to the Wood Solutions Timber Talks podcast. Here are some of the most recent topics. We had Davina Rooney, who's the CEO of the Green Building Council of Australia, talking about getting on course for carbon neutrality, uh, especially in the context of the times right now that we're going through. Also, the La Trobe University project team. We had Danielle Pichella and Danielle Savio and Atreyu. And most recently, it was the Nanyan Technological University in Singapore. So we had the project team on for that and Gary Caulfield, who will be familiar to a lot of people on this webinar, and also David Kingham were uh, interviewed. And last week, we also released the Wood Solutions In Focus videos, and this is on the YouTube, Wood Solutions YouTube channel. And this is something I wish I had my, or had, had access to when I first entered uh, timber designing, because it really gives you an in-depth in knowledge of how all the products are manufactured and it's produced at a very high quality by a colleague of mine, uh, Lawrence Ritchie. So again, next week's webinar, please join us at 11 a.m. for the post and plate timber construction. And thank you very much for, in, uh, for attending this morning. I see Peter Collins, he's uh, mentioned about the in-focus videos. They are amazing and yeah, totally agree with that. But I'll see you next week and have a great rest of your day.